If you watched our show on why 2024 will be the worst year ever, you're probably still recovering from that monstrous bucket of badness that we poured on you. But never fear, dear viewers, we have the perfect prescription for you. Our counter show that we're sure will put a smile on your face and make you feel better about the world. Before we get into the nitty gritty of things like war, polarization, obesity, mortality, and world changing artificial intelligence, there is something we need to set straight. We mentioned in that video that people right now in their masses see negativity ahead. 70% of Americans, we said in the last show, are feeling down about the future of their country. Much of the world, according to the surveys we cited, is one big bag of doom and gloom right now. The stats don't lie, and with the global cost of living crisis and so much political polarization, you can understand why so many people might check the bad box on the digital survey forms. Even so, you have to remember that humans have an inbuilt negativity bias. Scientists say, and they agree on this, that humans react more strongly to negative stimuli. They're prone to dwell on negative things more so than positive things. So, is the world really as bad as it seems? When people ask this question, someone will almost always bring up the fact that way fewer people right now live in poverty than they did in the past. And why not? That's true. The world poverty rate has gotten much better. The UN says in 2015, 10% of the world's population lived with less than $1.90 a day, which is extreme poverty. But did you know, in 2022 and 2023, according to the Poverty and Inequality Platform of the World Bank, the rate has been between 8.5% and 9%? Surely, that's something to smile about. Poverty levels certainly increased around the pandemic, but put in the context of human history, we aren't doing too badly. The UN says the world poverty rate was 16% in 2010 and a massive 36% in 1990. On its website, it wrote, Ending extreme poverty is within our reach. This target is less than 3% of the world living under $1.90 a day by 2030. Other statistics say 24% of the world's population, around 1.9 billion people, live in dire circumstances. They are impoverished. Even so, there is some good news for them too. China and India have been the biggest success stories in terms of eradicating poverty, with both nations together taking over 1.1 billion out of extreme poverty between 1990 and 2022. China said in 2020 that it had eliminated extreme poverty altogether, and India is expected to have only about 5 million of its population living in extreme poverty by 2030. 44 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa have seen a decrease in people living in extreme poverty since 1990, but 18 countries in that region experienced an increase. Unfortunately, Sub-Saharan Africa is thought to account for about two-thirds of the world's extremely poor. In the US, the relative poverty rate was 13.5% of the population in 1990, rising to 15% in 2010 following the economic crash and falling to 11.5% in 2023. That's kind of good, but we should add that the rate was 10.5% in 2019 before the world got battered by a pandemic and a very costly war. By the way, the poverty threshold for income in the US is designated at $14,580 a year, about $56 a day. That's for an individual in 2023. For a family of four, the US says the threshold is $30,000 a year. The UK poverty rate stood at about 25% of the population in 1990 and is close to 20% today, about 13.4 million people, of whom, according to one foundation, around 6 in 10 are not able to afford an unexpected expense. That is not good, but in terms of doom and gloom and how things were in the recent past, it's also kind of a bit better than business as usual. To understand what the poverty threshold is in the UK, you have to work out what is below 60% of the median household income after housing costs in the country for that year. So it's different all over the country. On average, for a single adult, it works out to 150 pounds or about $182 a week, with destitution being 95 pounds or $115 a week after housing costs. As we said in the other show, the cost of living crisis in the UK right now has made many more people destitute, but the UK is not alone. 7.4% of the Canadian population lives below the poverty line of $25,252, or $18,000 US dollars, for a single adult household a year. But reports say 1.8 million Canadians live in what is referred to as deep poverty of less than 11,700 Canadian dollars a year. The same reports say these 1.8 million Canadians will have around $1,000 a year left to feed themselves, 
never mind to have fun. Still, the Canadian poverty rate was 14.5% in 2015 and 10.1% in 2019, compared to today's figure of 7.4%. Even so, around 6.9 million Canadians are said to live with food insecurity. Again, it's not great news, but we should keep in mind that those small improvements happened over a long period of time. In Australia, about 3.3 million people, 13.4% of the population, live below the poverty line. This works out to 489 Australian dollars or 314 US dollars a week for a single adult. In 2023, about 2 million Australians lived with food insecurity. Okay, so maybe now you're thinking, wasn't this supposed to be a show about the positive things in the world in 2024? Correct, it was. I mean, it is. What we're saying is things have generally improved where poverty is concerned over the last 10, 20, or 30 years. Times are hard right now with ongoing conflicts and getting over the pandemic, but things have been a lot worse in the recent past, and a hell of a lot worse if you go back 50 or 100 years. We understand under current conditions us telling you this might not exactly help. Even so, we just wanted to show you that nothing out of the ordinary is happening. And anyway, it's a good place to start with all the very positive things happening in the world. We talked about artificial intelligence in the other show on 2024, discussing some of its more negative aspects. What we were really talking about is the rise of generative AI, the kind of AI that uses deep learning models to create content, which if it's very smart, should look like a human produced it. Maybe you suspect this show is written by AI, but could AI ever invent a word as good as duck squagamubosh? Nope, we didn't think so. Studies show that about 25% of jobs in the US are at risk of being automated by some kind of AI, not just generative AI. It's also been said that 36% of US jobs are at medium risk of being given to a computer in the near future. These numbers change depending on who's doing the predicting, but whatever the source, we're told tens of millions of jobs will soon be done by a robot. This sounds like terrible news, but AI is also creating a lot of jobs. For instance, in 2023, the remote job site Upwork reported it had seen a 1,000% increase in jobs being offered in the AI field. Jobs in general on Upwork increased by 230%, but the website says the hottest area for new work has been with AI. The current theory is AI will create almost as many jobs as it'll replace, and the good news for the employees is many of the most mundane, dangerous, and repetitive jobs we currently have will be done by a computer. Let's face it, no one ever really enjoyed screwing on bottle tops on a production line for 10 hours a day. They'd likely much rather be doing something more human, more creative, that gets them to use their brains more. Sure, there are memes going around that AI is taking all the good jobs, the creative ones. Still, AI is a long way from writing an album as good as Radiohead's OK Computer, an album about social disconnection in a technologically dependent society. You highly creative people, your jobs are safe, we think. Word on the street is that we won't only need machine data scientists, machine learning engineers, and specialized researchers for AI, but we'll also need people to oversee AI in all of its forms. We'll need cybersecurity specialists to keep an eye on AI systems, and we'll need people to keep checking their accuracy. As AI goes through ridiculous amounts of health data, we'll need health data analysts to look at what it's found. Humans will constantly be checking AI as the computer does all the grunt work. Recently, the UK's NewsQuest group said it was looking for an AI-powered reporter. The reporter's job was to use AI and check its accuracy and its ethics. Payment wasn't great at about $27,000 a year, but you don't need to be a genius to point out obvious disinformation in text, or to see if the AI has said something highly offensive, or even hallucinated, or even made up a word like duck squagamubosh. If you do educate yourself on AI, the future looks very bright. When we started making this show, Netflix was looking for a product manager for its machine learning platform, offering a wage of $300,000 to $900,000 a year. That's some serious cheddar. We just looked at the Indeed job website in the US and found 28,124 jobs related to AI. The top one was writer slash editor AI training projects. The job description said, if you're a professional who works with text, we have an exciting opportunity to use your writing, editing, technical, and creative skills in a new and innovative way. Instead of thinking that AI will replace you, here you can help shape the future of AI. Okay, we know that sounds like we cheated since it fits our show so well, but we promise you that was the top job. Like many jobs these days, it was remote and freelance, so you can kiss goodbye to benefits and insurance. But the freedom remote freelance gives you suits certain kinds of people. 
AI, just as technological advances did in the past, will disrupt the labor market. But we very much doubt a big chunk of the world will suddenly become unemployed or unemployable. If we look at the unemployment rate in the US in 1991, it was 6.8%. It went down to 5% in 97 and to 4% in 2000. In 2010, it was up to 9.7 and then down to 3.8 in 2018. The US Department of Commerce in 2023 said it was down to 3.4%, the lowest in 54 years. And this is despite tens of millions of American jobs being automated over the last 20 years, especially in industrial and automotive areas. Many Americans lost their jobs to a robot in the last decade or two, but we found a way to employ those men and women. It's believed about 60% of workers in the world are now in occupations that did not even exist in the 1940s. A Goldman Sachs report in 2023 said AI would soon enough replace about 300 million jobs in the US and Europe. But that same report said AI would eventually increase the yearly value of goods and services by 7%. Most researchers believe AI is a major achievement. The UK government seems to think so too, saying in 2023, that AI will ultimately drive productivity across the economy. So, all you British folk, before you pick up your cudgels and pitchforks and go out smashing computers as the Luddites did to factories in the 19th century, remember that work is coming your way. The UK is one of the world leaders in AI too, sometimes said to be only behind China and the US, although Singapore and Switzerland might have something to say about that. There will be disruption, some rough and tumble, some hard times. But if those experts are right, AI will give as much as it takes. If you think about it another way, if much of the world suddenly became unemployed, could governments just allow people to go hungry and not have shelter? We guess quite a few of you are now nodding your heads, but we think it's unlikely this will happen in this day and age. At the very worst, some experts believe that mass unemployment due to techno displacement could lead to implementation of a universal basic income. OpenAI of ChatGPT fame CEO Sam Altman sees this as a possibility. He said not long ago, artificial intelligence will create so much wealth that every adult in the United States could be paid $13,500 per year from its windfall as soon as 10 years from now. If that's true, governments might hand over the cash in the form of a universal basic income. If much of the world's population did suddenly become destitute, while the mega-rich got much richer, you could expect great swarms of people to start marching down the street shouting liberty, equality, fraternity, or death. That was the French Revolution slogan. But don't worry, we won't get to that stage in the 21st century. In this show, we won't spend too much time on the recession that's supposed to be coming. All we'll say is as time passed in 2023, a growing number of financial experts started to say a recession could be avoided. We heard things like this from a well-known economist named Michael Gappin. Our revisions imply we no longer expect a mild recession and instead think the economy may be able to skirt one. Many experts hold the same or a similar opinion. What we can't avoid is more war. It really doesn't look like the war in Ukraine will end anytime soon. While Ukraine has had some success as of late, Russia's been digging in and Vladimir Putin has budgeted record amounts on defense. At the same time, his citizens toil in the defense industry and some fight on the front line. In 2023, Russia's unemployment rate hit a record low of 3.3%. That's bad news for people who want to see an end to the war. Could there be a diplomatic solution in 2024 that brings things to a close? In August, the US, China, and dozens of other nations met in Saudi Arabia to talk about Ukraine's 10-point plan for peace. Still, that plan, according to The Guardian, would mean a total, humiliating defeat of Vladimir Putin. Putin almost certainly won't agree to what Ukraine wants. Russia is shoveling rubles into a fire of war while Western nations help keep Ukraine's military machine in action. From all angles, it looks like this war is set to last for many months to come. That is really bad news if you adhere to what Economic Observatory said in 2023. The longer the war goes on, the deeper the economic crisis goes. One thing we will say is that all these elections coming up in 2024, including the US and the EU, could affect the outcome of the war. While Ukraine will do what Ukraine wants to do, global diplomacy in 2024 could start moving us toward an end to the war. Also, as CNN pointed out in 2023, U.S. and Western officials fear Putin unlikely to change course in Ukraine before 2024 election. The Hill seems to think the U.S. election may well decide the fate of Ukraine, Taiwan, and the rules-based international order. The Hill, like many other media outlets, says Putin is hoping for a Donald Trump victory. Michael McFaul, who served as U.S. ambassador to Russia under President Barack Obama, 
said on his Substack in August, obviously Putin is waiting for the outcome of the U.S. 2024 presidential election. If Mr. Trump is re-elected, Putin has reason to believe that he could strike a much better deal on Ukraine. As today's show is all about good things, let's say it's possible that the war might end in 2024. And hopefully the economic chaos the war has partly created will ease. A writer for Politico laid out a plan for how this might happen. In this scenario, Ukraine goes all out in 2024, and when the time is right, it pauses offensive operations, concentrating on defense and rebuilding areas it's taken back. Then in August, when NATO meets in Washington, Ukraine becomes a part of NATO. President Biden has said he won't do that, explaining he wants Ukraine to join NATO after the war. The reason is the specter of a massive world war, since the US might have to get involved directly in the war due to NATO's Article 5 Mutual Defense Clause. As we know, things could then get nuclear. No one wants that. But as the pundit pointed out, the US under that clause could make a defensive pact without taking offensive action. Just joining NATO will be something of a victory for Ukraine. With Western backing, it could concentrate on non-military strategies to get back some of the Russian-held territory. With the support of NATO, Ukraine might be able to achieve this not through the use of bombs but with diplomacy or maybe even sanctions or blockades on Russia. Ok, so this doesn't sound like something Mr. Putin would want at all, especially as Ukraine would now firmly be in the clasp of the West, Russia's decades-long fear. A rightful fear, given what's happened in the past. But what could he do when Ukraine is in NATO and has the backing of all those NATO members? The pundit writing for Politico explained, Yes, Russian forces could try to go on the offensive again, but the likely futility of attacking fortified Ukrainian positions now backed by the threat of NATO firepower would be a strong deterrent. Meanwhile, sanctions on Russia would remain, its economic and military strength would continue to erode, and Putin could only watch as his frozen assets abroad are drawn down to pay for Ukraine's reconstitution. He would be left with no agency and no options. In this scenario, Ukraine isn't ceding territory to Russia, but it still wants reunification according to its 1991 borders. Other NATO members won't pressure Ukraine into ceding territory either. It's risky, given Ukraine joining NATO could indeed lead to something truly frightening, i.e. a world war. But would Putin really go against NATO? If he was guaranteed peace, would he be okay with that? After all, Russia wants stable, non-aggressive neighbors. If Ukraine were part of NATO, it wouldn't be able to seek revenge. Russia needs guarantees of safety, as does Ukraine, as does the world. Let's hope we get it in 2024. It's possible, but whatever happens in Ukraine, that won't change the fact that Americans have been dying younger. We see a way out of this, which we think will happen soon. After all, we've reached the breaking point. In the last show, we talked a lot about health, namely the fact that people are dying younger in the US. In the UK, life expectancy hasn't been put into reverse like the US, but data shows life expectancy improvements have slowed down all across age groups. In 2024, something is going to change that will make Americans, well, make much of the world much healthier. It's a prediction, but it is a very reasonable one. There are all kinds of reasons for the mortality crisis in the US. It's still being worked out, but the numbers don't lie. Americans are dying younger. When you'd think medical advancements and what should be a better standard of living will be helping people live longer. While this has happened within all demographics, it's the poor that have suffered the most. In the UK, we are also seeing troubling data. The country's Office for National Statistics wrote in 2022, in 2018 to 2020, Male healthy life expectancy HLE, at birth in the most deprived areas was 52.3 years, compared with 70.5 years in the least deprived areas. Female HLE at birth in the most deprived areas was 51.9 years, almost 20 years fewer than those living in the least deprived areas at 70.7 years. In the US, studies and countless media articles tell us the average life expectancy difference between the rich and the poor in the US is 15 years. Some studies say over 20 years. It's been happening for a while, but never did we hear so much about dying young than in 2023. Also, in much of Europe as well as Australia, there were troubling stories about excess deaths of people of all ages, but especially the young. Time magazine explained that this was the worst decline in life expectancy in the US since 1921 to 1923. The article said, Low-income communities, regardless of the state, are more likely to struggle with access to affordable health care. They are more likely to live near toxic sites that develop lung cancer. They are more likely to live in food deserts and wrestle with illnesses like heart disease and obesity. And they are more likely to die younger from drug overdoses. The food we eat. 
This is a biggie according to more and more scientists. We've never seen so many stories about mortality as we did last year, nor as many podcasts featuring health experts talking about the things making us sick and dying young. They just about all blame the same thing. food namely ultra-processed food. In the UK, ultra-processed food makes up a whopping 50.7% of the diet, the highest rate in all of Europe. The UK also has the highest obesity rate in Europe at 1 in 4 people. The rates have increased in the UK faster than any European country, according to the OECD, but the US beats the UK in this regard. According to the Harvard School of Public Health, one in every three Americans is obese. The school said there are now 500 million obese people in the entire world, 10% of men and 14% of women. This is double the rate it was in 1980, and the arrows are pointing up in many, many nations. This is the breaking point. It's believed 60% of American diets on average consist of ultra-processed food. From adolescents, it's said that 67% of all their calories come from ultra-processed food. It's not exactly easy to avoid, given that Northeastern University's Network Science Institute says 73% of the U.S. food supply is of the ultra-processed variety. Still, if you visit parts of Asia these days, you see much of the diet that used to be natural food is being replaced with food that comes in bright packages and lasts for years on end. Sometime in the 2000s, Western ultra-processed food was exported en masse, and local companies then started to make similar products. If you look at a country like Thailand, this transformation has been profound. You can see the change to ultra-processed food everywhere, which wasn't a fact in the past. After Malaysia, Thailand is the second most obese country in Southeast Asia, now dealing with a serious obesity crisis that has grown in the last 20 years. Thailand's Department of Health Ministry of Public Health in 2022 explained that the prevalence of being overweight and obese among Thai adults was 47.8%, a massive increase from 2016's 34.75%. Only 28.3% of people were overweight in 2004, and 6.8% were obese. Almost half of Bangkok's population is now obese, not just overweight. The newspaper wrote, Tom Asad University Faculty of Medicine said that a nationwide survey between 2019 and 2020 had found that 42.2% of Thais aged 15 and above are obese. This increase is mainly in the cities, where people eat much more ultra-processed food. In the countryside, people still often do their daily food shopping at the local market or grow food themselves. Still, 7-Elevens are now almost everywhere. The first one was opened in 1989, but in 2022 there were 13,838, an increase from 12,432 in 2020. Their shelves are stacked with the ultra-processed cheap foods worsening the problem. Thailand is a good example of what happens when you switch from a whole food diet to a processed food diet. But you can see such increases in obesity and ultra-processed food consumption all over the world. Crappy food is the new smoking, but worse, according to some health experts. All this is bad news! Aren't we supposed to be giving you the good news today? Well, the good news is this. You might remember that in the 1990s, so-called big tobacco in the US went on trial, which reverberated all around the world. In 1965, 41.9% of Americans smoked. In 1990, a quarter did. And in 2023, the rate of smokers hit a historical low at about 11%. You can see similar reductions all over the world. Over time, we humans realized just how bad smoking is for our health. In the US, the government got in on it, and all kinds of initiatives helped bring down the number of smokers despite lobbyists trying to stop it. Our prediction today is this is what will happen with ultra-processed food in 2024. The pressure is on politicians to do something about the growing problem. More and more health experts are telling us an ultra-processed food diet is worse than even smoking. It's the worst thing we do, many scientists say, and most of us do it without even realizing how bad it is for us. A best-selling writer and scientist appeared on a podcast we just watched titled The Junk Food Doctor, This Food Is Worse Than Smoking. This man makes a solid case. He believes a good diet not full of ultra-processed food can help prevent 60% of diseases. More and more scientists are saying that the junk we put in the tank doesn't just cause obesity and obesity-related disease, but causes all kinds of people harm not always related to weight, cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. The New York Times in 2023 said it might even cause anxiety, depression, and cognitive decline. Such stories were all over the web in 2023, along with the stories of health decline. The science is sure about this, but we still keep seeing rising numbers of people who subsist on an ultra-processed diet. Many don't have much of a choice, but this will soon change. 
By the way, ultra-processed is not always what you consider junk, far from it. Some of it even looks healthy, but it might not be, like many funky cereal brands. According to the guy on the podcast we just mentioned, the majority of the British diet mainly comes from just a handful of companies. In the US, the leading companies that make ultra-processed food spent close to $40 million on lobbying in 2021. But trust us, in 2024, after all these early deaths, after knowing what we know about obesity and poverty, and how obesity affected our chances of surviving COVID-19, big food is going to find itself under the spotlight, just as big tobacco did. 2024 is the year the government kicks into action despite the money being spent by big food on lobbying. The pressure on politicians is just too much for them to not do anything. This is the year that humans are going to start looking at certain foods and drinks as they now look at cigarettes. We believe in the next few years, there will be warnings on certain foods, similar to the ones on packets of cigarettes where you might find some rather off-putting pictures. In fact, researchers are already asking for such warnings. We learned that from a news article that told us, a study looking at health records of nearly 200,000 people has found a link between cancer and the consumption of ultra-processed food. Cancer rates in the world have skyrocketed in the last 100 years. They increased 21% just since 1990. We can't just go and blame certain foods for all of that, but experts say our diet is one of the main causes. A paper in the National Institutes of Health also said this, Heart disease was an uncommon cause of death in the U.S. at the beginning of the 20th century. By the mid-century, it had become the most common cause of death. The CDC says two things are to blame for this, obesity and unhealthy diets. Also a lack of physical activity. In 2023, The Guardian wrote ultra-processed food raises the risk of heart attack and stroke, two studies show. Chemically enhanced, often sugar-laden food is highly addictive. It's designed to be, and it's bad for you. So why are there no warnings on the packets? A cynic would say there's too much money resting on us eating bad food and getting sick. But in 2024, you'll see a change. Governments will begin making nutritious food more available and more affordable for the biggest eaters of bad food, the poor. You're going to hear much more about the so-called toxic triad. Big food, big farming, and big pharma. As for Big Pharma, Morgan Stanley Research says obesity drugs will reach a value of $77 billion by 2030. By that, they mean drugs to help prevent obesity. The global diabetes market is $79.25 billion in 2023, but it's expected to reach above $134 billion by 2030. Only 108 million people had diabetes in 1980, but 422 million had it in 2014. 578 million are expected to have it by 2030, and 10.9% or 700 million of the global population will have it by 2045. Maybe not, because we believe there will be a concentrated global pushback against ultra-processed food starting next year. Yes, ultra-processed food has been linked to many diseases as well as diabetes. And for sure, this food is linked to the obesity crisis, which in turn is linked to the diabetes crisis. We just saw in Food Magazine that new research has found that the risk of obesity is 45% higher among adolescents whose diet is based on ultra-processed food products. And as you know, 70% of the majority of adolescents' diets in the US is made up of ultra-processed food. It's all a vicious cycle. Harvard Public Health agrees, writing in 2023, processed foods are making us sick. It's time for the FDA and the USDA to step in. It said, according to the law, any poisonous or deleterious substance which may render a food injurious to health should be banned. It added that there needs to be a paradigm shift in how we think about food. And we think in 2024 it'll happen and it'll be good for all of us. We also say this. AI, according to experts, is going to revolutionize the health industry. It's already revolutionizing diagnostic capabilities with all the data it can go through, and it helps treatment planning. We think it will soon help us better understand what we put into our bodies. AI will help with monitoring what we eat and what our food does to us with various kinds of wearable tech. Expect this to get much better in 2024. We are going to get healthy. We will reverse the current early death trend. The food revolution is on the way. And if you think we're wearing rose-tinted glasses right now, listen to this. We also think in 2024, it'll be the year people become less polarized in their political views. Yes, we said it. We see that happening at the end of 2023, and in 2024, it'll pick up speed. People are tired of being at each other's throats. They're much more aware now of how they're manipulated to keep using products, keep pressing like, and keep venting anger. 
Over the last few years, health professionals, even politicians, have been saying how this makes us physically and mentally unwell. We see a change in that too, which will come through our own self-awareness and acceptance rather than heavy-handed tactics from governments cracking down on how we use technology products. We won't just eat better in 2024, we'll also take care of our minds more. In 2023, we started seeing news articles about the exhausted majority in the USA. An article on Cleveland.com stated, an exhausted majority in America is tired of polarization. That year, a poll in Ohio showed that 55% of respondents said they were tired of people on their own side of politics being too extreme. The same survey said 44% of people said political parties focus too much on attacking the other side. Time magazine in 2023 wrote, Americans are tired of political division. In the body of the article it was said, most of us, upwards of 67%, are actually tired of division. We want peace in our families, calm in our communities, and unity in America. The animated comedy show South Park just highlighted and pilloried a kind of polarization we call the culture war. The episode told us what we know is true, that with some open-mindedness and a willingness to listen, to discuss rather than scream, we can put some of the fires of polarization out. Many called it the best South Park episode in years. For sure, some people argued about the meaning, but many people felt like this guy who wrote on Reddit, it was just phenomenal, everything, meta jokes, social commentary, genuinely funny. Satire is an amazing way to expose society's faults. In 2024, expect a whole host of great content on TV and film that shows us the error of our ways in regard to this festering division. This is no small deal, it'll guide American culture closer to the right track. The more we laugh at ourselves and do some soul searching, the less divided people will be. As we told you in the last show, the US has never been more divided than it is now. It'll get better next year, and entertainment will play a big part in this healing process. In spite of what happens during the 2024 election, we think Americans will become less polarized. People are concerned about the future. We can see that in surveys. They want to lighten the concern. Polarization, we believe, has already peaked. This is not what we said in the other 2024 show, but this is the positive version of events for 2024. There's also a lot of doom and gloom these days, and for good reason, but in 2024 we'll be even more united in trying to fix problems we face. As a famous man once said, an eye for an eye only ends up making the whole world blind. With that in mind, we hope you have a healthy 2024 in mind and body. In case you missed it, here's our bad version for 2024, why 2024 will be the worst year ever. Or make yourself feel better with what was the worst time to be alive in history? 